Welcome to Knowledgeable Aging. I'm your host, Jason Kotar. Join us today to talk about the benefits of dance and movement as we age is Jessica Connelly. In 2017, Jessica founded Dance for Wellbeing, one of Australia's most innovative providers for over 55s, delivering programs across the arts health sector. Jessica has over 30 years of performing, teaching, and educating others on the benefits of dance by providing safety conscious dance and movement programs for seniors across Australia. How are you doing today, Jessica? I'm very well, thanks, Jason. Thank you for having me on. Absolutely, thank you for joining us. I'm looking forward to our conversation. Um, before we get started, for those that are joining us for the live webinar, you'll see a control panel on your right-hand side. If you have any questions, type those questions in. Time permitting, we will do everything in our power to get your questions answered. So Jessica, I read a little bit of your bio, but I'd love to have you tell us a little bit more about your background as a dance professional educator and how you got into the aging space. Sure. So uh, yes, my background is predominantly uh, in training in dance, different styles, but, uh, mostly ballet and contemporary dance. Um, as a 16 year old, I was very fortunate to receive a scholarship to go and uh, train in France uh, for several years and then join several companies after that the following years um, to perform as a professional dancer. The years that followed after that, I um, went into education, so teaching both in private and tertiary education in Australia. Uh, and that followed oh, many years of both uh, teaching and choreography for young people. Um, about seven years ago, uh, I got very much interested in uh, working with older people. And I think the, the uh, point at which that happened was I discovered a, a lovely uh, organisation called the Arts Health Institute here in Australia, in Sydney. And um, they were a group of uh, artists of all different um, backgrounds, both visual arts, uh, performing arts, music, that sort of thing. And they worked closely with elders in aged care um, as companions. They would go and visit them weekly and then engage them with their art form. And I thought, gosh, what a wonderful, wonderful thing um, to be able to utilise an art form that you're skilled in to uplift and um, value elders in our community. So that's where I started. Um, I did some training both in um, the Arts Health Institute, unfortunately it, it doesn't exist anymore, but from there I went to uh, Dance for Parkinson's uh, Australia and did some training there as well. And then progressively I felt that if I'm going to work with older people, I should then um, really uh, qualify myself to do so and find out about old, old and ageing bodies, uh, what happens to us as we age so that the I guess the engagements that I might provide will be safe, um, but joyful and uplifting. So that's that's my background. I, I did do a Bachelor of Arts in Dance and um, some other qualifications in uh, Dance and Dementia. Uh, I've been overseas on a couple of um, grants, arts grants to look at best practice in Europe uh, and also America. Yeah. Very good. Um, Jessica, can, can you talk about elements and benefits of dance along with some examples? Absolutely. So uh, dance provides much, much more than just exercise. Unfortunately, dance can be uh, grouped with exercise uh, in general in society. But I would say, um, and I think that the medical profession do know, and there's a lot of research to say now that um, there are many more benefits that dance brings. And those really break down into obviously the physical, but um, it's the cognitive, social and emotional. So physically, of course, um, it is exercise, but it's exercise often to music. So having that musical element really does a lot for the brain. Um, it can stimulate the brain's reward centers and um, then on, on to physical balance, coordination, and for older people, it can reduce falls. Um, so what we do in, in um, different dance classes is target for different populations what that population might need. Um, other benefits are cognitive. So cognition is a big one. Spatial awareness, reaction time, decision making. Um, I can go into some little points, perhaps talking a little bit on research. I will say 
straight up also that um, I'm talking from a dance perspective, I'm not a medical uh, professional. However, there is uh, many uh, research papers, studies across the world that people can find that speak um, to all these benefits. Um, socially and emotionally are two huge ones for older people. Coming together for a dance session does wonderful things for our mood. We, we not only interact with people, but learning dance and, and movement with other people, often partner dancing, learning about how far you are away from someone, where your limbs are moving in space in regards to another person. That's all really working the brain and the body at the same time. And of course, emotions are lifted along with the music and being with people. Now, I know you guys do a lot of in-person and online type of, of training. How have you seen that impact the social aspect of, of the, the well-being for individuals? Very much so. So obviously being in an in-person uh, class or uh, context with dance is um, optimal because you're there, you can, uh, whether it's having a conversation prior, during, but often, and I would say uh, some of our programs are in aged care. So we might be working with people living with dementia that perhaps don't have that vocal uh, or vocabulary. So the, the fact that dance involves movement and communication with movement, it, it bypasses often the need to speak. So that in itself is a wonderful benefit. So that communication using movement can, we can invite people to dance, you know, lift them, uh, dance with them. They might, they might open up to a particular piece of music and so forth. Um, online, it's been very interesting. I feel over the pandemic, we've had to adapt and go online with a lot of our programs. And I have found um, online often doesn't suit a lot of older people, perhaps because of the technology, but those that do find um, they are able to do it, we, we have many, many benefits as in they're in their own home, so they feel comfortable. They can move at their own pace. Um, they can modify. We're, we're very big on saying, you know, before a session, please modify movement so that you stay safe. You can stay seated. Um, you can stand behind a chair and modify movements that way so balance is protected. Um, there, I think throughout the pandemic, it's been a saviour for many, many people. I've had comments such as, I don't know what I would have done if I hadn't been able to connect online. It's a reason for me to get up, get dressed and um, put on some makeup for the ladies or put on some clothes and connect with people. Plus you've got that added, um, I guess, benefit of feeling good after a session. So yes, I think it's, it's had a huge impact on a lot of people. When we get out of the pandemic, is the thought process that a lot of these individuals that may be doing virtual will want to come back in person? Or are you thinking maybe that this virtual training um, is going to continue? I would say both. I think probably the majority are really looking forward to coming back in person for those that can. However, there are a large cohort of people that cannot for several reasons, and that being their mobility won't allow them to move uh, that far geographically. They're not able to. Transport might be an issue. So in my mind, I felt um, it's good to have an offering of both for both people um, that may want to come back in person. You do, obviously, that's optimal engagement. But I think those that are used to being online, I have I have many participants that say, oh, please keep this going, Jess, because this is so uh, beneficial to us and we really enjoy being able to be in our own home and uh, not have to go anywhere. And yeah, so that's, yeah, I would say both. Okay. Uh, Jessica, you briefly touched on the research. Now, I, I imagine there is considerable research that shows that dance does offer excellent results as we get older. Absolutely. There is a large and growing body of evidence uh, to say this. I'll mention a couple of things, but people can certainly uh, go and find all of this um, online. Uh, there is, for instance, I would, I would mention dancing in the brain. So what it does for our, our cognition and, and, and the brain. There was a study 2003 through Harvard Medical School um, around um, stimulating the brain's reward centres and dance activating its sensory and motor circuits. So that's a 2003 study. 
Um, there are several peer-reviewed studies on the danceforpd.org uh, website that you can find uh, around Parkinson's and what dance has done for Parkinson's disease. Those include cognition, psychological symptoms and quality of life improvements in all those areas, executive function, anxiety and depression. So these do require, I might add, that a regular session. So all of these studies have been usually done over a long period of time. I know some of the PD studies are over three years um, and they're hoping to go longer for many others. Um, dance and dementia, there's many small studies around this uh, cohort of what dance can provide for people living with dementia and I've seen it myself. Uh, I've been with some of my aged care uh, providers for many years and examples might be uh, there's a lady M who was very uh, sort of reserved, did not speak over several years that I would visit regularly. She came alive to certain types of music. I would lift her up. She was able to stand, so we'd always support them. This was not during the pandemic because we weren't allowed to obviously touch people then, but during, this is pre-pandemic, um, we would dance and she just came alive and um, the carers were just amazed. So that's that's what it can do. It's It, it can be quite life-changing in those moments for people. Um, and then lastly, I would say broadly, many, many uh, new areas of dance and health. And there's many programs that are now uh, having research undertaken around them that improve uh, many chronic conditions such as ca cancer, stroke, um, mobility, uh, falls. And uh, that is using dance as a practice or a, a therapeutic approach for holistic recovery. So it's part of a whole holistic approach, say from both doctors and then they may, um, social prescribing is a huge uh, thing in the UK. And I, I do believe you have that in America as well. Uh, it's on prescription. So your doctor may say to you, why don't you go and do, let's find a dance class you can do that's appropriate and regular, uh, if you can attend that, that will help you not only physically, but socially as well, because we all know that you know, certain conditions can isolate people too. I just will make one point though, uh, dance and health, um, obviously there are many aspects that it, the benefits of dance can bring, but I would also, I, I like to advocate for dance as a whole for everybody. It does wonderful things to us. We might not have many conditions um, as we grow older. We might be quite physically okay, but you can still uh, feel loneliness. You can still feel isolated. I, I, you might just have one niggling thing wrong with your wrist or whatever it might be. It, so you don't have to have conditions to go to a dance class. I would really encourage people to to go for their well-being and their health. Yes. Absolutely. Um you talked about the different research. So if somebody doesn't have, uh, you know, something from the doctor prescribing that they do this, how does one begin to know the different types of classes that are out there and that the credentials for the instructor, whether it's in person, in other words, what should they be looking for? What should they be asking to make sure that this type of dance is, is going to be good for them or a loved one? Sure. Well, there'd be several ways. I would firstly, online is a great place to start. So keywords, you know, if it's around a condition that you may have, or you just simply want to find a dance class, you can find it online, whether you're, you know, Googling dance in your area, dance classes, styles of dance you might be interested in. If it's around a condition that you feel, I would talk to your GP or doctor first and say, is this appropriate for me and my condition? And then perhaps with the doctor, um, research what might be available or look on your own and then go, I would go back to the doctor and discuss with um, your medical professional whether this would be appropriate for you to uh, in, get involved in. I would also speak to the facilitator themselves. Uh, I often, they all, participants should be screened, if you like, as they come into a dance class. So mm -hmm. talking with the facilitator about certain uh, things you might be worried about or concerned or not sure about, that's a good place to start. And if you don't get those answers, um, I would perhaps, you know, look further or look, look at other programs. Um, there are a lot of dance for PD, um, dementia, 
I think it's growing. So I think it's worth finding, um, you know, those key programs in areas you may have to travel a little while. I know some people do, uh, but yes, I would I would either ask people, even local councils or areas where you live, you might have an arts program hub um, that you might be able to access as well. And again, communicate, talk to people and find out more. Yeah, I was hoping Jessica that you can, uh give us an overview of some programs that are out there for, for our aging population with regards to dance and movement. Absolutely. Uh, I would start for um, mobility reasons. There are many, many different styles of dance that improve mobility. And all of them that are standing or with partners are wonderful for older people. Again, I would just check with the facilitator whether it is the appropriate style because you, you wouldn't want someone who may have balance issues starting a, a Latin salsa class if they're not quite steady on their feet. So it's really finding the right fit. Um, there are many, I would go from many movement programs such as anything from Tai Chi, yoga, very gentle, through right through to uh, swing dance, depending on people's mobility. So it's really important that they find what is right for them. Overall speaking, there is dance for Parkinson's classes across the world, if that is something that people are interested in. That is a global initiative. You can find that online. And there are many classes over, I think, 300 communities. Um, as I said, different there are dance classes everywhere and that will improve mobility as long as they're safe for you. Uh, dance and dementia programs are often in aged care homes across different countries. So I would seek or ask carers in a home if there is one available. Sometimes they might even um, transfer residents to a class via a bus, for instance, that could be another option. Uh, else would there be? Many online. You can find so many online. Um, often if mobility is a restriction, seated dance is a really big uh, sector now. So I offer seated dance, I offer standing dance as well and sometimes there is a mixture. So again it's really thinking about what suits a particular individual and how that might benefit them. So Jessica you've been in this this industry for 30 years once again as a a professional and, and an educator where do you see your industry going here obviously we're we have the pandemic hopefully we'll be out of this sometime where do you see your industry going i see it growing all the time it is uh it is smaller in some countries here in australia we seem to have a smaller sector that is slowly growing uh we're trying to advocate more and more and come together to build that sector uh, i know in the uk and yourselves in the united states uh, the sector of arts and health, dance and health is quite large. So you're very lucky. <laughs> we are not quite as progressive as yourselves, but we're getting there. Um, I see it growing. And I think the more, there is a lot of research already, but the more research into perhaps, you know, really drilling down to what benefits for which perhaps conditions as we age, um, that will help and build further. Um, the World Health Organization has done and, and presents, you can find them online, many, many studies of research supporting the evidence around dance and health and arts and health in general. So I just see it growing and um, hopefully most of us that are involved in it can advocate further for it. Yeah. Now you are the co-director of the Dance for Parkinson's Australia. What have you learned about in the times that you know you're getting these credentials about the value of dance when it comes to individuals with cognitive concerns whether it's parkinson's or dementia i see i constantly see um the benefits that that dance and music provides i would um say to anyone that may have a loved one or even have a diagnosis themselves to try to get involved in some way, shape or form in movement and dance regularly, as, as regularly as they can and would like. Um, it changes people's lives, it really does. I have seen uh, participants go from, you know, being very reserved, internal, not speaking much to coming alive. I have seen people over the years improve 
with their mobility and become quite sprightly at times. Um, obviously, a lot of people with um, these chronic health conditions, they are degenerative diseases, so they won't get better, but it's the quality of life that we really need to value, um, person-centered approaches, really thinking about the person and, and what they, what their needs are. Um, often as dance facilitators, we are trained to you know, talk to our participants and find out what they love. So we will play music in our classes to tailor to their likes. So it's, it's a much better day when you're in a, a dance class dancing to music that you love rather than what the facilitator, uh, of course, I love all my music, but it's really tailored to our participants. So on our over, overall aspect, I would say for both people with Parkinson's dementia or any cognitive conditions, it's really important that you are really thinking person-centered to your participants and uplifting them, valuing them. It's meaningful. It needs to be meaningful what you are doing with them. And that then brings up their mood, and hopefully the quality of life as time goes on. Excellent, this has been great. Um, we have uh, quite a few questions, Jessica. So I am going okay. to start with you. The first question came across and they're asking, how often should my family member, my parents be involved in dance? Is it weekly? Is it a couple times a week? Is, is there a, do you, do you hit a, a certain pers a place where you're like, I think you're good and you don't do it anymore? What does that look like? Okay, so this, this depends on the person, of course, and how physically able and, and also mentally how willing they are mm -hmm. to, to participate. So I have different levels. I, I'll speak to my own experience with participants. I have people that come to me once a week, whether it's online or in person, and that is sufficient for them. They, they look forward to it every week. Often it's the highlight of the week, they say, mm -hmm. and that is quite okay. And that that's, that fits into their lifestyle. It's once a week, fine. I have others, however, that absolutely really feel, and I, I know a lot of physios, uh, physiotherapists have said to me, if we can push it to two times a week, the benefits are even more. And of course, that is with anything that you do. But I would just um, think about whether that is appropriate for you as well. If it is, that's great. And I would encourage that. Um, I also have participants that come to me three times a week and they absolutely love it and they feel the benefits even more. So I wouldn't overdo it, but um, <laughs> yeah, look, if you can come, it, it is optimum. I mean, if you can twice weekly, I would say that is the, the sweet spot, right. um, but it's really, you know, it's up to everyone. It, it might include transport and, you know, that's not possible for everyone. So I understand. Yeah. Uh, somebody asked, could you walk us uh, through what a typical session that you conduct looks like? Okay, yes, sure. So I would say if I, if I went in the middle, because some are just plainly seated and others go from seated progressing to standing. So I might, I might go with that model um, because what it does is sort of it, it offers all those three benefits. So a typical class might start with a lovely warm up. We are seated in a sturdy chair, usually without arms so that you can uh, move and you warm up slowly through the body. So it might target different parts of the body. We might start with hands and feet, for instance, and then think about uh, warming up different, the spine very, very slowly, the neck and so on. So there is a warm up element. Then we might move to both. Um, you might just have an upper body element and a sequence there and then you might move to a lower body element to warm up the legs and feet so it progresses as uh, I'll say a warm up but it, that warm up might progress over three or four sequences then we would move into coordination where you put top half and bottom half together and this is where the brain challenge starts so not hard but you know very um, I wouldn't say easy either there's always little challenges, but it will make you think. And that is purely for coordination, timing, uh, listening to the music and that sort of thing. So you're, you're then uh, adapting both to both ends of the body. Would we'll then perhaps go into a, a whole body dance. It might be even a song where you, you might even sing or hum along whilst you're moving. And then we would go up behind the chair, hold on to the chair for some support to get used to standing and do some weight bearing uh, with the legs 
And that is all around, you know, strength, leg strength, and again, coordination with the arms and legs. If appropriate for people, we then move chairs away if we're in a hall. And those that are able to stand, we would stand, we would do um, a motor, a, a traveling sequence. And it would be very simple to start with. Um, this is pending on what uh, participants you have, of course. So if it's a mobility session, we would really concentrate on you know, people's mobilities and I would level it at the participants that I have. So this is where the facilitator's experience and knowledge must be key to the participants that you have. If it's a, a dance for Parkinson's class, we need to be very careful. There's usually assistance and care is to keep an eye on people, making sure that everyone is okay. And um, we might move across the floor with a simple exercise and then perhaps a little dance at the end of the class to really uplift and learn something that's strategic um, that you might repeat the week after and repeat again the week after and add to it as you go. Or it might be a short little dance that you can do all in one go. So there's a, a, a large variety of facilitation that goes on with, between different teachers. But that would be something, um, one of the examples that I would have. In a typical length of a session is what, 30 minutes, an hour? 45 minutes online, an hour to an hour and a half in person. And the reason for that is 45 minutes watching a screen is plenty for, uh, well, for anyone really, I would say. Um, and because you're constantly watching a screen and watching the facilitator. But um, that is also in aged care. All of my programs are at 45 minutes because there's been research to say for older people and movement, that is enough for them. I would never go beyond a 45. Um, a session can be an hour, but it'd be 45 minutes moving and you'll have some social time. And that's really important as well. So before and after. So yeah, uh, 45 uh, online in aged care moving and uh, you, you need a little bit more time in person because you might be moving chairs, you might have drinks and sips and a little bit of social time as well. So it's important to have little rest breaks. And of course, I would quickly mention every session you have a warm up and you have a cool down. So at the end of a class, a cool down, a little bit of stretching, some breathing and, a, and what we call a reverence, which is a, a thank you both to the participants for coming along and to the teacher and to a musician if you have a live musician. Speaking of musician, how important is the music aspect of these programs? Oh, uh, it's, it's almost, it's a number one. I would put it up there in the category of not only is your facilitation need to be, you know, top quality, but your music needs to be on, yeah, absolutely well organized, well researched, um, constantly asking participants uh, whether they like the music, you know, feedback. Um, it is key, definitely. And to have a variety is key as well. I would never do a session that's all classical music. I would really give it a variety because of course you'll have your gentlemen in class that might like a bit of jazz or they're maybe into rock, who knows? <laughs> um, <laughs> opera, I've had opera, I've had requests of opera in aged care. Um, contemporary style music, instrumentals are wonderful because there's no lyrics to, to think about or worry to distract the brain. So just you're really concentrating on movement, but a variety is good. Songs are wonderful because it really brings people alive as well. So I would absolutely say it's key. Rhythm is probably the key component because it gives you the structure for your movement uh, rhythm and your body rhythm. So matching that, it's key in Dance for Parkinson's classes when we walk um, for their gait. There's something in the brain again that triggers the rhythm yep. does help those motor skills. Would you recommend if somebody's able to um, do either a one-to-one -one or a dance group class, what, what's recommended? Would you say the group because of the social interaction or, mm. or does, it, does it depend on the individual? Yes, it does depend on the individual. I think um, having a conversation around it, it, what would you like to try? I would try both if, if, it, if it was possible. Yeah. And it really depends uh, what context that the dance um, session is taking place. So for instance, I do a lot of one-on-ones in um, aged care homes. And that is wonderful because 
the the resident or the person doesn't have to go anywhere. They might be in a big chair and they can only move their arms. So I would sit with them for, you know, a half an hour and do a little dance, whether it's with our fingers and our and our hands, might find music that they love and so on. Um, it really depends, the context and the needs of the person. The social aspect of a group session is wonderful because you end up with a lot of fun banter and people perhaps even telling stories. And it's up to the facilitator to draw uh, information and let them, uh, let it unravel. Because I think uh, that is sometimes someone's only time where they're interacting with someone during the week, you'd be surprised. Other times there are very social um, over 55s or however we want to, I, I dare not say seniors because I have some people in my classes that are over 55, but they're not considered seniors yet. So uh, yeah, whatever, mature age people um, come from all different backgrounds. So yeah, finding the right mix is great. It's up to them. Excellent. Well, this has been great. Thank you so much for your time, Jessica. Um, how can people find you? Okay, so you can, I'm in Australia, so I'm a long, long way away, but of course you can find me online. Uh, my website is www.dance4wellbeing.com.au and uh, my email is jess at dance4wellbeing.com. Uh, you could call me if you wanted uh, in Australia, 61-419-449-578. I'm happy to, to speak to anyone if they have any uh, inquiries or interest in anything. Um, yes, there you go. I think, uh, yes, just don't forget the number four in the wellbeing if you needed to find me. Excellent. Once again, thank you so much, Jessica. As far as Knowledgeable Aging, you can go to our website, knowledgeableaging.com. You can see all of our upcoming and archived webinars. Go to YouTube, type in Knowledgeable Aging. I would ask you to subscribe. We update that several times per month. If podcasts are your thing, you can find us on Apple Tunes, Spotify, etc. Till next time, I'm your host, Jason Kotar. This is Knowledgeable Aging.